the Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the middle commercial on tonight's program, I'm going to have important information for fathers and mothers about a painless way to pay for your children's college education. A way to make sure that the cost of those four years in college is all paid for in advance. Interested? Then please listen carefully in about 14 minutes when I give full details on the Equitable Education Fund, a plan created for far-sighted parents by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Organized Crime. Its title, The Bogus Hijacking. To become a special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, an applicant must pass a rigid series of mental, physical, and character examinations. Passing them does not mean, however, that he will exercise his talents while seated behind a desk. Special agents go everywhere, frequently traveling as something other than a law enforcement officer. Occasionally, they assume the part of salesmen, messengers, taxi drivers, bank employees, factory workers, and a hundred and one other roles. Sometimes, as in tonight's case, they even pass themselves off as criminals. Tonight's FBI file opens at police headquarters in a large Midwestern city. A lineup is about to begin. Seated behind a glass wall just in front of the well-lighted stage are two people. One is Detective George Green. The other is a stocky, leather-jacketed man. A group of suspects marches onto the stage. After they get lined up, Baxter, just take your time and study each man. Okay. Oh, that's all right. You can talk up. We can see them, but they can't see in here. Can't they hear us either? No, not till I switch on this mic. All right, men. Line up in front of the heights marker. Uh, you two on the right, look up and straight ahead. Any of them look familiar? Yeah, that one. Under which number? Two. Second man from the left, step forward. Now repeat this. It's a heist, buddy, so take off. It's a heist, buddy, so take off. That sound like the hijacker? Let him talk some more. What's your name? Al Walker. Where were you at 3 o'clock this morning? In an all-night movie. With whom? You want any more, Baxter? No, Lieutenant. That's him. All right, Jailer, take the others back to the cells and bring Walker to my office. Evening, George. Hello, Harry. I'm sorry I had to call you away from dinner. It's all right. I want to fill you in before you see the prisoner. Okay. Now, he's willing to admit he hijacked the truck, but he won't unless he can make a deal. The job was interstate, so I said he'd have to talk to you. Let's go see him. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Walker, this is Agent Russell of the FBI. Hi. Detective Green says you're willing to talk. Sure. Forget the hijacking, let me plead guilty to violating parole. I can't make any deals. If you help us, though, I'll see that it goes into the record. You can take his word for that. What do you want to know? Everything. I'm from the coast. I hit town three weeks ago on a bum. A guy I knew in a can got me the job. Who'd you do the hijacking for? Andy Crawford. Did Crawford hire you directly? No. He gave the office to this pal of mine. Did you talk to Crawford? I never even seen him. 
How do you know who you were working for? When my pal paid me off, he said if I did a good job, Croft would have more for me. What's your friend's name? Joe Perry. Wasn't Perry killed in the stick-up last week? Uh-huh. Did he happen to mention what those other jobs would be? One of them. Uh-huh. What was that? Look, ain't I done enough singing for free? Well, that's up to you. But what you've said so far isn't much help. Yes, all we know now is that you worked for Andy Crawford and you can't prove it. <sighs> okay. My next job was going to be the warehouse at 7th and Madison. Now, that's the terminal warehouse for interstate shipments. Oh, yeah. You know any more about the job? There's a diner down the block, I hear. Never been there myself, but they tell me the driver's coffee up in the joint while the trucks are at the loading platform. Go on. Crawford was going to nail the drivers on the way out of the diner and let his own men pick up the trucks. When? Nine sharp tomorrow night. Now you got it all. All right, Walker. And thanks, George. The following day at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is signing in when Agent Harry Russell greets him. Jim? Hello, Harry. Hey, what's this job I was transferred out here for? It's my case. Oh? Yeah, the police arrested a man named Al Walker who said he hijacked a truck for Andy Crawford. Uh. Crawford's a local hotshot we've been watching for some time. Yeah. Well, Walker couldn't prove he was hired by Crawford, but he told us he was supposed to help hijack some trucks from the loading platform at a terminal warehouse. Here in town? Yeah. Yeah, the only place we can keep our surveillance from is a cheap hotel across the street. Your job will be to get a room there. Oh. oh now I get the no-shave order. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, one of these days you'll see my picture in the cough drop box. <laughs> On my last assignment, I rode a freight car in from Seattle and wound up with a beard this long. <laughs> Uncle Sam's got one. Well, his doesn't itch. Well, the storeroom's holding two suitcases with walkie-talkie equipment and old clothes for you. All right. When's this thing start? The job's due tonight at 9. Okay, let's figure out a cover story and I'll get over there. <laughs> Out. I'd like a single in front. We're full. I heard this was a right joint. From who? Stoney Wilson. Where'd you see him? Well, now, where do you think? I don't know. Cell number 737 at Rivertown. Yeah, you should have said that first. Can't be letting everybody in here, you know. Well, can I register? Oh, sure. How is Stoney? He's not so good. Tried to bust out, but they nailed him. That's too bad. Yeah. The back rooms are quieter. I like to know who's walking around in front. Oh. You got good cover here? If any cops get past the desk, that fire alarm accidentally goes off. That's swell. The front rooms are $3. And you want it now? Ah, uh, you got bags. All right, all right. How about a key? Oh, here. Room 86, third floor front. Thanks, Bill. Unit 1, calling Unit 2. Unit 1, calling Unit 2. Come in, Unit 1. All set at this end. How's your view of the loading platform? Perfect. I can also spot anybody entering or leaving the diner. Good. Oh, and say, Harry, there's some stores between the diner and the warehouse. Might be worth knowing what time they close. They'll all be shut by the time the pigeon shows up. Okay. Anything you want, Jim? No, not right now, thanks. I'll have some work for you later. Someone to the door, Harry. I'll call you back. Hello. Hi. New, ain't you? Yeah. I'm Ellie. Here's your towel. Oh, thanks, Sonny. Go easy with them. No more till Monday. Towels come Monday and Thursday. Bed sheets Tuesday. All right. Those are the only days I work here. I got another job Wednesday, Friday, and weekends. Private family, but I like this better. You get to talk to more people. Where are you from? Auburn. Last man had this room was from New York. 
told me all about the subway and Radio City and everything. That's nice. You know, I never did figure what he did with all that soap. Got so I was leaving two pieces. But you think there was ever any left? Not a drop. Well, thanks for the towel, Zilly. If I want anything, why, I'll just... It would have been different if he was clean, but every day the dust in the tub was thicker. I guess I'll take a nap. Good thing for you. Man up the hall takes one every day, and he don't any more look 71 than me. Yeah, well, thanks again for the towels. I'll see you tomorrow. I was to Auburn once. Nice, friendly place. Ellie, I'm really bushed. A nap would do you good. Yeah, I know. Sure been nice talking to you. Uh, thanks. Unit one calling Russell. Unit one calling Russell. Yeah, Jim. That was the maid. Did you see anything? No. Good. Call me back about four if you can. Okay. A detective named George Green is coming over to set up the car details for tonight. I'll give you the dope next call. Sorry, Harry. I got tied up at headquarters. Sorry, George. You heard from your man at the hotel yet? Yeah, about an hour ago. Yeah. He's all set. Oh, good. I've got a rough well, diagram here. See what you think, huh? Well, all right. Take it now. Uh-huh. Uh, the dotted line is Madison Avenue, huh? Yeah. yeah. And X is the warehouse loading platform. Okay. The number one across here is Taylor. Mm-hmm. Number two is me. I'll coordinate. Fine. Number three is a bureau radio car cruising this area. Yeah. The minute Taylor spots any action, it'll cut down Madison and follow the first truck. Uh, why not make the arrest right, uh, right yeah. there? Well, we've got three other hijackings Crawford might be mixed up in. Tailing the trucks could take us to where he stores his loot. Oh. Unit 4 will be your car. On 7th Street, huh? Right. Then if the truck turns this way when it pulls out, I won't have to U-turn. Mm, check. Oh, Unit 5 will be another of your cars cruising here. And uh, 6 will be one of ours. They'll handle the second truck? Yeah, and anything else that's around. Crawford's pattern sometimes includes a car to haul away the drivers. Yeah. Uh, we're supplying men to drive the trucks? Yeah, one apiece. The warehouse people have been alerted? Uh-huh. Yeah. We had to so they could load dummy crates onto the oh, trucks. Yeah. Well, I think that covers about everything. Be ready at 9. Unit 1 calling Unit 2. Unit 1, calling Unit 2. Come in, Unit 1. Hey, I've got 859. That check with you? Yeah, a minute to go. Well, they're finished loading the trucks. Good. Driver's coming out of the diner now. Any sign of Crawford? No, not yet. Well, if he shows... Hold it, Jim. Russell speaking. Oh, yeah, Tommy. Pulling another job? Watching the Rocky Adams fight in Madison. The what? I'll have the report checked and get back to you. Harry, if it's true, this whole deal is one big false alarm. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. Now for a moment, let's listen in on some questions and answers that helped rid one father of a worry that had been nagging him for quite some time. In the living room of his home, a father, Tom Edwards by name, is talking to Fred Barton, his Equitable Society representative. Yes, my two kids are only 13 months apart, Mr. Barton. They'll be in college together. You know, that's going to cost me a fortune paying for two college educations at the same time. Sort of worries me even though it is quite a few years away. Well, there's an easy way to nip that worry in its bud, Mr. Edwards. An equitable education fund. Well, what's that? Well, it's an endowment life insurance policy with the Equitable Society that will be all paid up when your youngsters are ready to enter college. 
It's just about the most painless way of paying for a college education anyone ever thought of. What do you mean, painless? Well, you've probably paid for some of the things you own by the time payment method. This house, maybe, or your car, or that TV set. That's just how this equitable education fund works. Instead of having to put out all the money in four years, you spread the cost over 12, 14, or 16 years. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, and here's another point. If you should die before the plan's completed, from then on, the policy's paid in full. The Equitable Society holds the money, and interest is paid on the full amount every year until it's time to use it. That's another big advantage of an equitable education fund. No matter what happens to you, your youngsters are sure of a good education. Well, it all sounds fine if it doesn't cost too much. Oh, Mr. Edwards, the cost of your equitable education is strictly up to you. The fund you set up needn't pay the entire cost of college. Just make it enough so it will soften the blow. Also, by starting when your kids are still young, the yearly cost is much lower. Just figure out what you can afford. And I'll... If you have children of your own, why not get the cost of an equitable education fund from your equitable representative? These equitable men give you the information you need and let you make up your own mind. Get in touch with your equitable representative soon. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> And now back to the FBI file, The Bogus Hijacking. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates an important point on law enforcement. Not every piece of information received by the Bureau is accurate. During the last war, for example, more than 2,800 separate tips poured into FBI offices in one day. In this present emergency, likewise, thousands of reports come in telling of suspicions held by private citizens or, as in tonight's case, by the local police. Some can be dismissed after a routine glance at the files. Others take the manpower and effort you have seen spent on this investigation. The important thing is that each report is checked and rechecked. Only in that way can the Federal Bureau of Investigation be sure it is doing its job it's 24-hour-a-day job of protecting your property, your life, and your liberty. Tonight's FBI file continues ten minutes later in the cheap hotel room occupied by Special Agent Taylor. Calling Unit 1. Calling Unit 1. Yeah, Harry? We just double-checked that report on Andy Crawford. It's true. He's at Madison Stadium with all his men. Chalk up one more bum tip. I'm afraid so. Well, at least I can get rid of these whiskers. Not yet, Jim. Detective Green has a date to re-interview that prisoner tomorrow. But maybe I can get him to do it tonight. Give it a try, will you, Harry? I'll stand by. If I don't call right back, I'll see you in the morning. Where? Here. The SAC wants you to check in for further instructions. George? Yeah, Harry. Did you see Walker last night? Yeah, he was as baffled about the job being canceled as we were. He's trying to get more dope for us now. From whom? I don't know. I gave him permission to make a phone call. He spoke to somebody, explained about being in jail, and asked why Crawford didn't pull the heist. Hmm. His friend said he'd check and call Walker back. When? Yeah, probably sometime today. Have uh, you got any ideas if this doesn't work? Well, we might try moving Taylor into the Crawford mob. Yeah, Crawford's pretty cute, you know. Neither of us can spare the manpower for a constant surveillance, George, so it'll have to be something pretty direct. Yeah, I guess you're right. You sticking around till Walker gets that call? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll go up to the office and meet Taylor. Walker, I hear you got your call. Yeah, and the deal ain't off. What? My pal told me they're still going to pull the warehouse job. When? He's trying to find out. Well, who told him that much? One of Crawford's guys. Well, Crawford's men were all in Madison. They got back this morning. Oh. You see, Crawford's a good friend of Rocky Adams. That's why they went to the fight. When's your friend calling again? He made a meet with this guy. 
We ought to be here and right after that. When's the meet for? Today, but I don't know what time. Okay, I'll wait around. Harry, I'm sorry I missed you this morning. It's okay, Jim. Yes, AC, so the warehouse job was still on. Yeah, so we hear from that prisoner. Oh, any idea when? Not yet. That's dandy. You ever hit that hotel I'm at? <laughs> no, but I've heard about it. Well, I'll give you an idea of the place. I'm the lobby dude. <laughs> oh, pardon me. Sure. Agent Russell. Harry, this is George Green. Walker, get that other call? Yeah, just now. The job's all set for 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock when? Tonight. Huh? An hour from now. Can you get the same men you had last night? No, they're off duty and I can't reach them. You better get two others then and brief them as fast as you can. Yeah, right. I'll work from unit number two tonight, George. How about Taylor? Can he spot for us? He's here now, but he'll be on his way to the hotel the minute I hang up. Oh, hello, Ellie. I'll have your bed made in a minute. Not that I'm as quick as I used to be. I remember once I was in her... Ellie, will you leave it and change it tomorrow, will you? Can't. Tomorrow's Wednesday. I'm only here Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Other days I work... Yeah, I know. I I know. You, You told me. Then why'd you say for me to do it tomorrow? I made a mistake. That's the man for you. Ellie, look, will you leave everything? I'll make it myself. He can make a bed himself, too. Yeah. <laughs> we were married nine years, and he never did one right to the day he died. Ellie, look, I promised to get it perfect. Recall the fella from New York I was telling you about? Yeah. The one used to have this room before you? Yeah, yeah, I remember. He always kept a bottle in that upper drawer. Guess it was just habit made me look tonight. <laughs> You don't have a little something on you? No, no, not a thing. Let's say good night, Ellie. I'll see you Thursday, huh? Might as well finish now. Just leave, leave it and come back later, will you? Well, okay. Thanks. Be an hour or so. That's fine. Unit one calling Russell. Unit one calling Russell. I'm all set up, Harry. So are we, Jim. Call in the minute you spot anything. Unit 1 calling Unit 2. Unit 1 calling Unit 2. Come in, Unit 1. Everybody in position? Yeah. Good. This looks like it. Well, the trucks have just been loaded. The drivers are on their way back from the diner now. Any sign of the pigeon? No, but the drivers are being followed by two men. You got time to give us a description? There's not enough light, Harry. Wait a minute, hold it. Harry, a gray sedan just pulled up to the curb. Hey, the drivers are being forced into the car. Car's pulling away, heading north, north on Madison. Turning left on 7th. Unit 3 will take that. Okay. Where are the Pigeon's men? Just getting to the loading platform. They're each taking a truck. Motors must have been running, Harry, because here comes the first one. Which way is it turning? South on Madison. Unit 5 will follow that one. Second truck's leaving. They're separating. He's turning north on Madison. Going past your corner. I see him, Jim. I'll take him for myself. Okay. Good luck, Harry. Unit 3 to Unit 2. Unit 3 to Unit 2. Come in, Unit 3. Suspect car on River Drive passing 39th Street. How many in it? Five. And one of them's a head pigeon. Good. They're turning west on 41st. 
Stay with them, George. Unit 5 to Unit 2. Unit 5 to Unit 2. Come in, Unit 5. Suspect truck driving north on Rogers Avenue. From where? 11th Street. The truck I'm with is heading south on Rogers Avenue. Where's the sedan? Moving the same way, so they could be headed for a drop. Russell calling Unit 1. Russell calling Unit 1. Come in, Russell. Jim, it worked. Did you get the head station? We just arrested the whole mob at Crawford's warehouse. You close up there and come back to the office. All right. Oh, never mind, Ellie. Well, I'm set to go home. Oh, that's all right. I'm checking out. But you just moved in yesterday. Well, it goes that way sometimes. Hate to see you leaving so quick. Thanks. We never got a chance for a real heart-to-heart. -heart. Well, maybe next time. You'll be coming back? Could be. Where are you going now? To get myself a shave. Andy Crawford and members of his organization were convicted for a violation of the theft from interstate shipment statute and sentenced to a federal penitentiary. In tonight's case from the files of your FBI, you have seen an example of the kind of cooperation that exists today all over the country between local law enforcement agencies and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Without such help, your FBI would find it impossible to meet its present full schedule of work by making its crime laboratory and its records available to every police force. The Bureau does its share in the great cooperative effort to defeat the common enemy of all of us, the American criminal. Now, a quick review of the advantages of an equitable education fund. First, it's the painless way to pay for a college education. You spread the cost over many years instead of taking a beating in four. Second, it's sure. From the moment you start, you're certain your children will get the kind of education you want them to have, regardless of what happens to you. So why delay? Ask your equitable representative for full information on an equitable education fund. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Misery Chiseling. Its title, The Bad Samaritan. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Anthony Barrett, Walter Catlett, Ben Classetti, Bill Conrad, Sam Edwards, and Isabel Jewell. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bad Samaritan on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for A Life in Your Hands, starring Lee Bowman, which follows immediately. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.